Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times Live Conversation Series, Times Talks. I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's Times Talks DC event, Women of the 116th Congress, featuring four representatives of the most diverse and inclusive class in that body's history. If you haven't already, please be sure to pick up your complimentary copy of the new book, The Women of the 116th Congress, Portraits of Power, a celebration of these history-making women that first appeared as a special print section in the New York Times in January and was published by Abrams Image in October with expanded content and is the inspiration for tonight's event. I want to give special thanks to tonight's presenting sponsor, City. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Candida Wolf, Executive Vice President for Global Government Affairs at City. Candy? Thank you, Tom, and uh, many thanks to the New York Times. City is proud to be the presenting sponsor at tonight's um, important Times Talk conversation on women in the 116th Congress. I'd like to thank Representatives Brooks, Davids, Miller, and Underwood for their participation in this evening's panel. It's really remarkable that we're here tonight talking about 131 women in Congress. When I first went to work in the Senate, in the early 90s, we had a total of seven women senators. Fortunately, since then, that number has tripled. And today, there are 25 women who serve in the Senate and with one more to come. And there's always room for improvement, but we're certainly on the right path. In 2005, I was fortunate enough to be asked to serve as the assistant to the president for legislative affairs. What I didn't know when I was asked to do that and later discovered was that I, I was the first woman to ever serve in that position, a position that had existed since the Eisenhower administration. And I'm pleased to say that since that time and in succeeding administrations, women have served in that role. I certainly can't take credit for it, but I think that finding more and more that when women are given positions of power, it's more likely that another woman will follow in succession. Earlier this year, Citi became the first bank to disclose our unadjusted or raw gender pay gap. While this raw or ugly number, as our CEO uh, puts it, showed not that we don't pay people equally for equal work, because we do, but it showed there was a lack of representation among women at the highest levels of our firm. That's why we now set representation goals for female talent globally. These specific and publicly disclosed goals are ambitious, but achievable. Um, targets that will increase senior level representation for women over a three year time period. Disclosing that ugly number confirmed another commitment we've made as a firm, to be more transparent with ourselves and with the public about areas where we are making progress and areas where we quite simply need to do more. In the museum lobby tonight, we're featuring the issue of gender pay in more detail. I hope that after this uh, event that you will see the four photos of children of city employees capturing the moment when we told them that generally women are paid less than men. Our message is that we should all feel the way they do. In the lobby, you'll also find an interactive exhibit in which we're inviting you to give us your own impression and how you and your organizations are tackling this issue of gender pay. We hope that you'll join us to advance the conversation further and more importantly, to advance women's representation. I wanna thank again the New York Times for convening such an important gathering and all of you for attending. And now back to Tom to introduce our wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you, Candy, and now on to our program. Moderating tonight's event is Jennifer Steinhauer, Washington correspondent for the New York Times and author of the upcoming book, The Firsts, The Inside Story of the Women Reshaping Congress, coming next March. Joining Jennifer on stage are photojournalist Elizabeth Herman and four history-making members of the class of the 116th Congress, Representative Susan Brooks of Indiana, Representative Sharice Davids of Kansas, Representative Carol Miller of West Virginia, and Representative Lauren Underwood of Illinois. Please join me in giving them a very warm welcome.
Good evening, everyone. Hi, thank you. We've got a lot of women up here doing a lot of women talking. Never know what could happen. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I wanted to just get right into it um, with this wonderful book um, that started off, obviously, as a series of photos in the newspaper. And Elizabeth, I wanted to tell you, talk about kind of what the goal of that project was and maybe um, your sense of why it resonated so much. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having us. Um, it's an honor to be here. I, uh, when we started thinking about how to capture women in this new Congress, um, I went to the Times with this idea that we use this sort of style of historical portrait paintings and we photograph the new class and all the members that have been serving for a long time in this style. And it was kind of a nod to how power is changing, how power looks in 2019, while also recognizing that there's a long history and it's taken a lot to get to this moment. Um, and we're celebrating the centennial of women gaining the right to vote in the US this year. And I think that the comment, yeah, you can clap for that. That's a great thing. To it's insane. I mean, you know, I think that working on this project, looking at the history and seeing how recent so much of the change is, is really exceptional. Um, but I think that seeing the scope of women now constitute nearly 25% of Congress, um, which is still not parity, but getting there, and then seeing that as a whole, but then also seeing how each individual member has their own history, their own story of how they got to office. So it was a combination of nodding to history while being in the present and acknowledging the scope of everybody together while having each individual represented in their own way. Um, and uh, Congressman Davis, I want to start with you picking up with that. Um, it's OK. It, it's not that going to be that hard. Um, <laughs> talking about um, um, your photograph um, as part of this project, your election is one of the first if only two Native American women ever elected to Congress was historic. And I know we've talked a lot in the past about sort of um, the feeling of that. And I'm curious, what you, when you went to this, did you bring that sense, that historic, a sense of historic responsibility, if you will, when you were here doing this particular interesting um, diptych shoot and what this was like for you as a new member? Um, <laughs> well, it, it is interesting. I know we, we've had a number of conversations about the uh, historic nature of, um, I mean, m my own race and election, uh, but also just the historic nature of this class. And uh, I, I remember when we when we got there for the for the shoot, and we were looking at all of these pictures, and just being struck by how how different things are going to look, not just, I mean, in this class for sure, but um, going forward and, and recognizing that this is, um, we took, a, I think, a, a pretty decent sized step in this uh, 116th Congress, but the, just, you know, soon, although Deb and I are the first two Native American women um, in Congress, soon it, we'll be talking about the fifth Native American woman in Congress, the seventh Native American woman in Congress, the tenth, and and that is literally what I was thinking about when we were flipping through these through these uh, historic pictures and how you know it, in history will look back on this time and see that you know, there's a lot of women sitting on a lot of stages. Right, interesting. Um, and Congressman Underwood. Um, I want to talk to you um, a little bit about your experience as, as I think, the youngest uh, woman, uh, certainly from your district, the first woman to, from your district ever elected. Um, you get elected, yay, we won, and everything's exciting. You think about what you're going to come, I'm going to make laws, I'm going to do things, and then you get here. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what, what, <laughs> what We're has, here. Yeah, here we are, um, I guess, I don't want to ask you about disappointments as per se, but what has been kind of, um, would you say most different in your experience from what your expectation was when you stood there on, a, um, on Victory Night? Well, it, the Congress is a historic place steeped in tradition, and some things uh, just never evolved. 
<laughs> and so, you know, our use of electronic communication, I would say, has never evolved. Uh, and so we do not email with each other about legislation. I don't have the email address of so many of my colleagues. I don't have the email address of my chairman. I don't, like, that is not how we communicate with each other, which is very different from my professional experience and background. Um, you know, the idea of constantly being double or, my experience, triple booked because every single one of my committees meets at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday, right? Like, this is just something that I had not experienced before, but it really impacts the way that we do the work because I thought I was going to have an opportunity to go deep, and that is not what this job is. Um, and so, you know, you adjust and adapt and learn quickly um, and try to, you know, make smart decisions uh, in representing an incredibly dynamic community that is not uh, homogenous at all, right? Like, my district is huge. Um, people are across the political spectrum, and we have to, you know, represent them, right? Like, that's the job. And uh, it's been an exhilarating, really fun, crazy uh, 11 months. And, you know, I'm excited that we get to do it for another year. <laughs> I have to say something. Um, because I am on the, mm. to solve your problems that we're all talking about, that uh, happens to members of Congress and how Congress operates, there is a select committee on the modernization of Congress. I'm a member of it, and I had a hearing today. We talked about scheduling. It hasn't constituted since, like, 1994. Um, and we do it every quarter of a century, um, but we're talking about technology, we're talking about scheduling, we're talking about so many rules. Making it so we can communicate with our constituents. We're talking about that, way. we're talking about franking, which most people didn't even know what that was. We're talking about everything, and uh, it's a really going to be a positive. It's a very bipartisan, it's completely bipartisan committee. We're rolling out recommendations, so stay tuned. We're hoping to improve life, yes. because I agree. I mean, it's crazy, kind of the life we live. Well, I wanted to pivot to you anyway, because you're the most senior member up here, also retiring. Um, and I wanted to Trying ask to fix you, things. Not, um, not about Frank and Mail, actually, but um, <laughs> what um, is kind of your biggest takeaway when you're sitting at Thanksgiving with your friends and your family, kind of your secret anecdote that you tell that really kind of tells the story um, of being in Congress. It's kind of just a private thing that you tell them and 300 people at the museum. <laughs> Well, something that I, most people just really don't appreciate is that, for the most part, we all really enjoy each other, mm -hmm. okay? We all share, and we, most of us, you know, came through tough elections to get here in the first place, and uh, the friendships are deep here. And in fact, because I'm retiring at the end of this Congress, um, that's the thing that I'm gonna absolutely miss the most. And, you know, whether it's the friends you made when you came in as a freshman, they're all freshmen. Um, I'm now what would be a senior, um, and in, in more ways than one. Um, but uh, but uh, we all really do enjoy and respect, um, you know, the journey that people have taken to get here. And we all get along. I mean, when you see us crammed in an elevator with, you know, 20 people going to and from votes, the jokes, the laughs, the, the camaraderie is real. And um, so, you know, that's the kind of thing that uh, people don't uh, appreciate. It's not really talked about very much um, because we put on often the game face or the TV face in front of, you know, the cameras at hearings and on the House floor. And that's actually not at all how it is one-on-one. -on -one. Interesting. Um, Congresswoman Miller, um, the, as you know, the number of Republican women actually fell, even as the overall number of women of, in Congress increased um, in the last election, and there's, and there's some retirements coming. And I often ask Republican women this, and it's, I find it interesting because I get different answers. Um, is being one of the few um, Republican women, you know, in, the, in your caucus, in your conference, um, but then also one of the few Republicans among women, like in the you know, in the women's groups. What, when do you feel more like um, aware of um, sort of your minority status? Um, in, in which situation? I've just always been one of the guys. <laughs> so uh, when I ran for the state house, um, out of 100, there were 19 women. So I've always been used to um, just kind of knocking and letting them know I'm there. So I, 
I can't give you any knowledge as to how I feel differently as a woman. I'm very glad to have as many women as we have. And of course, we do need more Republican women just to balance We're working out. on it. I know. Um, but you just, you learn to make friends and find things you have in common and move forward. Um, and we have some questions that came in um, by email, because we do communicate by email um, <laughs> with our readers. Um, and um, so I'm going to uh, put this actually to all of you. Uh, this is from Morgan. Um, she says, what is a story that your friends and family like to tell about you? <laughs> I can tell, um, Congressman Davids, that you feel like going first. Oh, I was going to, Lauren? <laughs> um, gee. So I guess, OK, there's a story about uh, when I was a kid, my, um, my mom got called in to, to speak with my teacher. I think I must have been in second grade or something. And um, the teacher said, you know, we, Sharice won't stop talking. <laughs> surprise, surprise. And uh, the teacher said, first, I thought it was because she was sitting next to her friend. So I moved her. And then it turned out she was friends with everybody I moved her next to. So then I moved her kind of off to the side so she wasn't right next to somebody. And then that didn't work. And then so I put her in the hallway. And it turned out she just talked to everybody who walked by in the hallway. <laughs> so I figured if I, set her if I put her desk next to my desk, the problem will be solved. And then I realized I was talking to her for 20 minutes. And I was like, Sharice, I have to get work done. So we're, we're going to have to start. So you know, she called my mom in to see, like, what are we going to do about this? And um, I, I, don't, I, don't even know what, I don't even know what the outcome was. You ran for I Congress, managed, obviously. I managed, get, I managed to get through school. But um, my mom really likes to tell that story. <laughs> I'll go. Great. Um, and I don't know that my family tells the story, but at a class reunion recently, some friends told the story. When I was a senior in high school, um, we did pranks. I think they still do pranks, but there are a lot more rules now than I think when I was in high school. But my, my parents uh, encouraged me. I come from a family of teachers, but they encouraged me because I like to argue, maybe with them a bit, uh, to be a lawyer or to consider law school one day. And uh, during senior year, uh, one of my classmates, uh, one of my best friends, did a prank uh, on, at school, a very stupid, really dumb prank, just super glued lunch trays to the table. I mean, and then just watch people try to take, I mean, it was dumb. But, <laughs> but, you know, she caused some property damage, what have you, to the school. And the principal, uh, they were not going to let her walk uh, for graduation. Uh, they thought, and she was, had been an awesome student, a fabulous athlete, had been kind of leader, but they were trying to do this zero tolerance. And I said, if she's not walking, I'm not walking, and I'll get a lot of people not to walk. And so I went in and talked to the principal, and they changed their mind. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, you know, just being an advocate, it, 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 she definitely, and then I became a criminal defense lawyer uh, <laughs> as my first job, uh, you know, learning how to help people get out of trouble who often were in trouble and had often done the thing that they were accused of doing. Um, but then I think that was kind of uh, uh, really told the story of what, where my career might lead. I think so. Um, so when I was in high school, I used to enter into a lot of contests. Um, I love winning things. <laughs> I, I really do. I, I am competitive, but I like just, I, it could be a contest or a sweepstakes or a drawing. I don't care. I just like to win. And um, so I subscribe to a lot of pu publications, love a magazine, love a newspaper, like the print newspapers. I used to be territorial growing up. Like no one could get to the newspaper before I opened it. Because you know, you open the newspaper and then it all gets shuffled up and it just takes away from the experience. And so, um, but this is not a story about a newspaper. It's a story about a magazine. So 
Uh, I was I was a subscriber for YM Magazine, which is dating myself a little bit. Uh, for the Gen Zers here, they're like, "What is YM Magazine?" Um, and it was a it's a teen it was a teen girl magazine, and they decided that they were going to do a profile of 15 year old women across the country. And so I entered into this contest, and somehow they picked me. And and Good Morning America was supposed to be coming <laughs> to my high school to follow me around for a day. And so my parents were like, "Oh God." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what is Lauren going to say to these cameras following her around school all day? Because like Sharice, I like to chat and, you know, I would just say anything. And then it turns out that they had scheduled the shoot a week before I turned 15. So I was technically 14. And that is how my mother was saved from the horror of me <laughs> sharing all of my thoughts and stream of consciousness on the, on the news um, in the morning. And, and my mother talks about this on the, in my community a lot because she would always say, I never knew what Lauren was going to say. <laughs> if, if asked, she would just tell the truth. And now we get to do it, you know, as part of work, and it all works out in the same way it did for Sharice. Um, but we were spared in those teenage years, and it was great. I need to say that these stories so far are completely unsurprising about all of you. <laughs> Congresswoman Miller. Well, most of the stories that are told about me are more now because we raise American bison and there have been so many adventures. But I started thinking back and I had two sons and our house was sort of the Kool-Aid house where everybody came, everybody spent the night. I never knew how many people's feet would be under my table at night. And we live in a small area, I live in West Virginia, and middle school kids love to TP each other. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what that means, they get giant rolls of toilet paper and they decorate people's front yards, and it's usually the ones they really like, which is a good thing. And my older son had a group of boys spending the night, and raising boys, they would argue for, if they only had an hour to play, they would argue for 45 minutes to set the rules, and then they'd only have 15 minutes to play. And so I was used to that kind of thing, and they were very, very quiet one night. And I thought, mm, they're gonna be up to something. And because they were sleeping on the third floor, I had this big feather comforter, so I dropped it on the landing that would go up to the stairs. And you know, they all went up to bed about 10 o'clock, which was unusual. And I thought, mm-hmm, they're going to go out. So I got underneath that comforter. <laughs> and they come tiptoeing down the steps. And I raise up. In the <laughs> and they all screamed and went running upstairs. So they didn't go out teeping. So that was the kind of stuff I was up to. That's, good. That's a good one. Did that surprise you? That one, I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm still processing that one. <laughs> I, but, but, um, so um, we were, you heard the remarks earlier, there's a, a been so much discussion about pay equity. And I know um, when I've been researching this, this has been a topic that women have been talking about in Congress since there have been women in Congress, basically, and certainly since the 70s and legislative efforts. Um, Congressman Underwood, what do you think, um, does government have a role to play um, in this issue? Yes, 100%. And uh, it's something that we have made small steps forward in, and yet there's still so much long, a longer way to go. And I think that equal pay um, is something that women are struggling with in every community across this country um, at each income tier. It seems to impact uh, people, uh, and part of it, I think, is related to maybe a lack of knowledge. Sure. And you know, one of the things that we talked about when we worked on the Paycheck Fairness Act this spring was that so many companies have those like non-disclosure provisions where you're not allowed to talk with your colleagues about compensation. And I think that um, that gets to be tough, particularly uh, for people early in their career where they, you know, folks don't even know what the benchmarks are. Uh, what the floor and the ceiling could look like. You just are glad to have a job, right? I graduated from college in 2008. Mm -hmm. And in t the fall of 2008 is when the economy collapsed. And it is my cohort that for many of us as millennials are still underemployed, 
Um, you know, we're not hitting the wealth goals of the generations that came ahead of us. And so the idea of being paid fairly and equally is something uh, that almost for some people feels like a luxury because at least now they're being paid, right? And so to, to have an employment contract where you're not allowed to talk about compensation with your colleagues, that's tough. And I think it's wrong, and I think that it's absolutely the role of government to put some guardrails around these practices that don't allow employees to advocate for themselves, don't allow workers to get ahead. Um, in an economy where you know we know that there is significant inequality um, across the country. And so when I come to Congress as the youngest black woman ever to serve in this institution, I try to make sure that we are advancing policies that allow our generation, our cohort, people have never even had a chance to be at the table to come out ahead. And this is one of these unifying economic issues, uh, particularly for women, that I think it's so important that we don't lose sight of the opportunity for progress. And Congressman Brooks, do you agree with that? I think, I think that part of... Um, it's not working. Oops. Thank you, whatever. Thank you. I think uh, in, in part I do, but I think it, this is, has to do with the fact that women who now make up the largest majority of college graduates still are not rising to the level of leadership in many of our companies. Um, we still don't have nearly enough women at the top, women in the C-suite, women who are asking those questions of the, the private sector employers in particular. And so kudos to City for doing that analysis and for publicizing that and talking about it. Um, and, and we know that studies have been done that when there are more women on the bo corporate boards, when there are more women in the C-suite, that actually profits of companies tend to go up. And I think that the more women we have in leadership positions, um, and we as a country are not doing nearly as well as we should be doing um, in having women in leadership positions, challenges like this will eventually become a thing of the past. But we're not there yet. Um, we have a long way to go. And, um, and I think that, um, that government does have a role to play, but yet I always want the private sector to lead. And the private sector needs to be, and women and girls, I think along with men, need to be you know, demanding this and saying that we need to make sure that women are paid. I've had women chiefs of staff since I came to Congress, okay? I am in the minority on con at Congress of having women chiefs of staff. I had a woman chief of staff and a woman LD. And so we've got to lead by example. And uh, I think those are some of the ways that will make a difference. Congressman Miller, um, you beat, um, I believe, two men in a Republican primary in 2018. Is that correct? Um, and which is. More than that. Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, which. That's right, let them know. Which is, um, you know, difficult, often been difficult, um, and you defeated a Democratic man who was running in your district, I believe, as a pro-Trump kind of Democrat uh, guy. So what's your secret sauce? A lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. um, I, there were seven, thank you. There were seven in my primary. There was a, another female, um, and I cleaned their clocks. <laughs> You know, I, I, I worked very hard, and I'm very sincere in what I'm doing, and I, I think that people just recognize that what you see is what you get. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't come out with all these grandiose things to say. I just am very sincere, and if I don't know something, I'll say, I don't know about that. I'll get back with you, or let me do some more research. Um, because I ran for office because I, at my age, <laughs> which is over 60. Um, I've raised my family. I'm so fortunate. I, my grandchildren live within a mile of my house, and most people cannot say that. But I wanted to leave the world a better place than I found it, and I started with my state, and I ran. Um, I lost the first time I ran, and the second time when I ran for the state house, um, I, I was there for 12 years, and then once this seat became open, 
um, my father was a congressman, so I always had had public service in my soul. I've always done volunteer work. I volunteered in the school system 17 years. Um, I was on all kinds of hospital boards and, and arts. I was West Virginia Commission for the Arts. So I, I did a lot of volunteering, and I, I turned my thoughts to the state to see how I could help our state, which was struggling. And so then when I ran for this, um, people knew what my goal was, which was to, to leave the world a better place than I found it. So it, it did take a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of fire in your belly because for a woman to run, it, to step out of yourself and you realize your entire family is affected by running and you, you know they'll, they run billboards against you and ads against you and it, it as a woman you're more prone to be protective and and to stand out and and say okay i'm going to take this and realize everybody around you is going to take it too it you know it's a hard thing to do but um i encourage any of you women out there i can't see too far but i encourage you if you have that feeling within you that you want to make things better and you're willing to step forward, do it. Um, we, um, Congressman Brooks, you and I have talked a lot about the role of women supporting other women, um, particularly financially. Um, I would love to hear more about that and from any of you who want to talk about the role of women in electing you. Well, we'll see. I might. Thanks, Teresa. <laughs> um, I was sharing earlier that um, Often women, and I was in a seven-way primary also, uh, but I didn't clean their clocks. I won by 1%, and that's all it took uh, in that primary. Um, uh, but what I found in running, not only the first time, and what I think often a lot of women have found, is that often our largest financial donors, and let's be honest, you gotta raise money to win these races. It is very, very expensive, at least at the congressional level, and even now getting more at the local and state level to run and win races. And because um, without getting into what the money is all spent on, um, you gotta raise a lot of money um, to get your message out, particularly if you've never run before and you don't have name ID and so forth, it takes a lot. Um, and and, they're, and it's in smaller amounts. But the, what I learned and what I was disappointed about initially was that my largest donors were men, okay? And I think studies have been done to show that actually men are much at higher level donors than women. I don't know if that's happened to you all, but if you look at your reports, you will probably see that. And we need to get a shift, we need to shift in this country and get more women to be more engaged uh, in supporting candidates at all levels. I'm not just talking about Congress and getting, we, we need men and women to support women. It can be at whatever level you can afford, but there are many, many women who can't afford to give at higher levels, but they give maybe philanthropically, but often don't think about giving to those candidates, and particularly strong female candidates, at what's called the max out level. And we need to, I think, change that discussion in this country and get more women more comfortable giving at higher levels. Was that your experience in your race, Congressman Davids? Oh, yeah. Um, sorry, I don't know why I was like. That's <laughs> <laughs> me. Well, I mean, definitely, so I'm a, I don't come from a family with any money. Sorry, Mommy. She's not here, she, but I've said it a lot before. So, um, you know, my mom was in the Army for 20 years and enlisted, and then now she works at the post office, and um, I was raised by a single mom. Who I have two little brothers who are actually really big. But um, I think that part of the problem is the structure, the, whole, the structure of the whole thing makes it really hard for people who don't have, uh, I mean, you, you don't get paid while you're running for Congress. And when you have races like that, a, a, a primary that's f filled with lots of people, um, you don't, you can't work and truly campaign and run like a legitimate congressional campaign. Um, I can tell you in, in my race, more than the, the giving, because um, I think that that's it's probably that it's the same for a lot of us um, that the that 
the bulk of the higher level giving is um, comes from men, uh, which is a good and a bad thing. Um, the number of people who treated volunteering on my campaign like it was a full-time job and were literally in every single day. They were there almost as many hours as I was, making phone calls, knocking on doors, writing postcards, like all of the things that, uh, that a person can do to help a candidate. Um, that's where the, the women in, uh, in my race made the hugest difference was the, the blood, sweat, and tears, tears. That we, that we all put into it. Interesting. Um, if we could get the um, picture of Lauren Underwood again um, and turn back to the photos just for a second as we pivot to talking you know, broadly about women in power, I'm curious, what, um, if you could tell us a little bit about these diptychs and what um, the thought was and kind of what you learned or what you think they portray about women in power right now. It's incredibly interesting to hear all of you speak about your experiences running for office, being in office, interacting with people as a woman in power, because, you know, I think that when I was sort of thinking about the approach to this project, I, what I had in my mind is I'd walk through the National Portrait Gallery and it has an effect on you. You walk through and you see a room full of beautiful portraits. It's all old white men, except for Barack Obama, but it's all men, um, and you, it really sets in with you that this is the way power is pictured and the effect that that has on you and the effect that that can have on generations and generations. And I think that there's a lot about this when women run for office and conversations about electability, what it means to be electable, what it means whether people are likable enough. There's a whole lot around that word. Um, and I think that part of the reason why this is a conversation that continues to come up is because we as a country aren't used to seeing women in power, whether that's in boardrooms, whether that's in the government, whether at high levels, at low levels. There's research that shows that when a woman is elected at the executive position in the state, more women are then elected at lower levels of office. So having examples and not just in sort of being able to visualize what those examples look like and what power could look like, I think that that was what really drove this. And so I think that, you know, there's this sort of taking this visual trope and using it to speak to, this is the way that we've seen power and conceived of power. This is the way we've been conditioned to think of power in this country. But what does power look like now? What could power look like in the future? I think that that was really what these, and to me more than anything else in this project in some ways, seeing the diptych side by side was what sort of really drove it home for me. It might be a little obvious, but um, I think that it's, it's helpful. It's like, oh yeah, I have, when the word power comes into my mind, this is what comes into my mind. What, what could come into my mind? What, what, how has power evolved in this country and how should we evolve sort of our collective imagination as a country around it? What was your experience of that? What did you think of that pairing? What was, um, what was it like to do that particular shot? So this was on a day, I think it was the day before swearing in, which was just an incredibly busy day because we were just getting into the office. I remember I started the day and my phone rang and I thought that somebody was calling me, but it was actually my first constituent call and I answered the phone. And we had like this, which doesn't happen in Congress, and had this really interesting exchange and I was literally just figuring everything out, right? And so my team said that we had to go and do this photo shoot and I was like, okay, uh, and didn't know what it was gonna be about. So we walk into the room and this is very rare in these types of congressional things, but all the ladies were in there. So there's this incredible energy uh, and conversation in that, in that very small room as everyone's getting their portrait taken. And, you know, I try to follow directions. And so she was like, okay, we're going to do this somber, serious thing. And, and I will usually just come in, sit down, and give you the biggest smile. Okay, put your chin down. Okay, look to the left. Okay, and then we're done, right? And so she's like, oh no, we have this draping here. It's supposed to be like the portraits. And I had no idea what she was talking about. <laughs> and then about maybe like after one or two frames, you said, okay, I need you to sit down and lean in like this. And I was like, what is this girl talking about? <laughs> this is so crazy. Like, I didn't, I had no idea 
that it was going to turn into this. And, and one of the things that is so special to me is that not only was it in the paper, and it was just like such a beautiful, beautiful visual, but now we have this book, and it's just iconic. These photographs are so strong. Everybody's uh, personalities, their essence, but then also their strength comes across. Um, and, and it's not hierarchical in the way that so often power is described in Washington. It's like each of us. Um, are these warrior women that made it and were effective and were strong, and I love it so much. I, I, I am so grateful to be included in the project. I am so grateful to be paired with Mr. Lincoln from Illinois. It's just so perfect. Um, and, and I treasure this. It's framed in my office, um, and, you know, it's just incredible. Lauren Underwood does not work for the New York Times. I don't. I want to make that clear. I don't. Um, but my sister does. <laughs> and but 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 well, I mean, because we're supposed. I mean, because if I didn't say it, you guys were probably supposed to say it. And uh, but that has nothing to do with any of this. We didn't know that. Yeah, they didn't. Well, know I that. didn't know that when I was shooting that. But when we were on the last day, but when I went in, I'm a freelancer. I don't work at the paper, but I got to go in as the special section was closing, and all of the spreads were laid out. And your sister came up and pointed at your photo, and it was super interesting to see. Like the, I mean, all of the images just laid out on the table, and there was um, because we ran different covers for every section. The section covers were lined up, and and people just came through it like it was a gallery exhibit. All the editors sort of walked through. It was a very interesting moment. Um, you know, I'm not working at a paper every day, but it sort of felt like something that was unusual. What does your sister do? Uh, my <laughs> my sister is an editor in the style section. Oh. <laughs> right? She's very fashionable and fabulous. And she provides excellent critiques Was on she uh, messing with what your we do. magazine? With your YM magazine? Oh, well, you know, she wasn't an editor back then. Oh. So it she worked out with, with the YM magazine. So I wanted to um, ask uh, Congressman Miller this question, but any of you can feel free to also respond to this. Um, we talk a lot about the disadvantages of women running for office and, and being in office, but talk about some of the advantages, perhaps. Oh, you can go first if you feel really <laughs> that you need to. I do, well, go ahead. Do you mind? Okay. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I realized when, I don't remember how, I don't know if I should share this, actually. Yes, okay. you should share it. Okay, <laughs> it's only because it's you guys. Um, one of my opponents in the primary was, so I had a six-way primary. Uh, there were four men and one other woman who got in after I did, which I will say that someone at one of our forums asked her, why did she decide to get in when there was already a woman in the race? Wow. And I was like, can I say something? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, when, when we've got six women in the primary, then maybe when that's happened like 15 times, you can ask a woman why she's planning on getting in the race. Until then, the more the merrier. And I'm glad that you're in the race with me. And she, you know, and then she gave her response. But I would, but there are, so that's like one of the, that goes to the earlier point of like some of the drawbacks. And when in the history of the Republic has someone said, there's already a man in the race. Why did you decide to get in? Um, so I think that uh, one of the advantages I felt like was, it's, it's my real life amplified. I'm used to people saying things like, well, why did you decide to do that? Or what were you thinking? Or don't you think you should do it this way? Or why is your hair down? Or why isn't it in a bun? Or how did you decide to smile? Or how did you decide to... And I'm used to all of that. But I have a feeling that some of the guys in the race were not used to every, every single decision they made from the suit that they wore that day to the tie they chose to the way that they phrased an answer being critiqued every, every, every direction they looked. It was, and, and that is the nature of running for office. That, men and women experience that. I'm just used to it. I'm con I've been conditioned for this. And I felt like, uh, in some ways, I was like, this is my superpower. <laughs> <laughs> because because I, already knew, I already knew how to handle it internally. And so I thought that that was a big advantage that I had. Good. 
That's a good one. <laughs> well, I will say, as a woman, and most of you know that, we have seven plates spinning in the air all the time. And so it wasn't unusual to add another plate, so to speak. Men are very um, oriented to, <laughs> to fixing a problem. You know, they will solve that problem. They won't look at anything else that's going wrong. And, you know, you joke about the man going, it's time to leave. The man goes and gets and sits in the car. We turn out the lights. We feed the dog. We check the mail. We change a light bulb. We do, we, we're always looking at everything around us at all times and so to me that was an advantage because you, you have to you have to see what all's going around you and you have to judge you know your response and you know you have your foot over here and your arm up here and you're doing this and you're holding everything together and women by nature do that so I do feel that that was an advantage you know you we bring a different perspective we bring a different value to the table all the time can I also say, though, that this was an, a unique election, at least in my district, where the women were the ones that were driving forward change. And so everything in the Illinois 14th was oriented around these ladies. Uh, and their names are Pat, Barb, Sue, and Marge, and they're the ladies of the 14th district. Oh, and I had, I like had Nancy's they, and Jans. Yes, Nancy's and, and Jans, and, you know, Kim, and, you know, Paula and you know just love love the ladies and what I think is so special is that we can speak to these core issues of family and community uh, with real alignment and understanding because we live these challenges too uh, and we are of our communities and we I mean we right like this is this is this unique thing that's happened um, I think with this class is that we're full of real people. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think is part of the magic. Uh, my mother always would say, be a woman, Lauren. <laughs> Whenever I would be like scared or frustrated and that was like her code for like dig deep, be courageous and go for it and do it, be a woman. That is your strength, hmm. is that you're a woman. And, and I think that we see that kind of sprinkled in, in, in the ladies of the 116th Congress. Interesting. And, and those previous. Um, I'm gonna, um, I have another question from the audience, it's from Beth, and I was gonna um, actually give this to all of you, not because that's a lame moderator technique, but because I actually think everyone is so interested to hear from all of you, and particularly on this question, because this is on the forefront of so many people's minds out in the country, um, and Beth asks, what are your recommendations and what steps have you personally taken to reduce the divisiveness so that Congress works collaboratively to lead the country? I was You're in a hearing voice. today where I asked a witness uh, that exact question. <laughs> um, he actually was the staffer for the last committee that uh, was constituted in 1994, okay? And I asked, I mean, what because we do need to be leading in the country. And because Congress, and he said, because we appear so polarized in Congress, it does spread out in the country. And so um, he, what they were making suggestions just today. I'm sure you can watch it on C-SPAN if you're really bored. It probably was on C-SPAN, it was a two o'clock hearing. Um, that was interrupted by votes and then yeah. we had to go back, um, part of our scheduling conflict. But, um, but what uh, he was sharing and, and what we were talking about were things like how, how do we improve civility in this place? And yet we all, for the most part, actually, like I said, like each other, but the way the schedule works, the way committee hearings work, the way um, we, we do not have many places where we are together. Um, you walk into, and I joke, you know, we say um, reach across the aisle. There literally is the aisle on the House floor where you actually have to go across the aisle to talk to someone else. Same thing with hearings. And so in this modernization committee, 
I'm sitting by Susan Del Bene and by Emanuel Cleaver, and we're mixing it up, and we're saying, hey, maybe we should have days where the committees come together um, and have a joint session and talk about our priorities. What might we agree upon? What, where might the consensus and those things that we can agree upon rise to the top? What, that that might get hearings first or that might get action first. So there are things that we can do and that we need to be doing and we need to, um, you know, I think pay attention to things like the Luger Bipartisan Index. I'm proud to be one of the most bipartisan members in the House, and I would encourage these freshmen, you gotta get your staff to think like that as well, um, because the staff is often who bring us bills to get on and things to be involved in. And you've gotta just set that priority from the beginning. The problem is, is that while our constituents like to hear that we're bipartisan getting things done, still voters often don't reward that. And we need to, I think, get voters to be thinking about what is this person getting done with the other side of the aisle? What problems are they solving together? Um, so th those are some things that are, are real, that we know, and this group of this modernization group really realizes um, that what we're working on is going to benefit these recommendations that we're going to roll out. Uh, finding common space, changing schedules, changing how committees work actually could make a difference. It sounds boring, but we think that if we could get our place to work better, um, it could actually help the country. I, I'm, I also think that we need to do more social events together as Republicans and Democrats. Travel? Actually, and we helps. did that in Israel, and it was wonderful. Um, when we could dine together, it, you break bread together, and there are some prayer groups that are bipartisan, which are very important. But again, when when you can break bread and you can talk to each other, um, I think it makes a huge difference when because you can start relating to each other about family, about all those things that we feel are so important, and you realize that you have things in common, and that's what you're supposed to do, is you're supposed to find what you have in common and work from there on issues as well. Uh, one of the things I tell people when we are going to keep it real, so I'm going to do that now, uh, about Congress is that it's uh, in a lot of ways not like high school, but it's like middle school, <laughs> where uh, you know the people who may not like each other, it may not be for a specific reason. And so what may come across as divisiveness and gridlock could just be that, you know, so somebody did something really small to that other person and they, they just don't like it. And they're two competitive people and, you know, somebody holds a grudge, right? Like I've seen that happen. And then that small grudge turns into being colleagues for 30 years and it just feels entrenched, right? Um, sometimes the disagreements aren't about policy. It might be about process or it might be about credit, who gets credit for an idea, or who gets credit for passage. And then that can end up being the sticking point and it just manifests itself as that people can't get things done, but they actually agree, <laughs> which is what's so tragic about it, right? And so I think that the way that we break through some of that is when I think about our class and how many of us, you know, had not done this before, you know, this was not like the next logical step in our lives, it was not the next logical step in our careers, and there's a lot of sacrifice involved in serving uh, our country in this way, and so we have this sense of urgency about the work and a real commitment to say, well, I'll work with anybody to get this done because my community needs it, right? And, and it needs to happen now. I don't have 10 years to wait until I might become a subcommittee chairman, right, to be able to work on this priority. Like, we need it now, and so who else cares about it in this body, and we can figure it out together. And I think that that mindset, uh, it, it's different than the way that other people have worked, right? We're new, we don't have these built up, you know, grudges or issues or misunderstandings, if we're being generous about it. And, and, and I think that that, that can change uh, the pace and the, the feel and hopefully the optimism that we have for the future in terms of coming together and getting things done. One of the things that I've been, um, so I do a lot of events, um, some on the political side, some on the official side, but uh, I get some version of this question at it doesn't matter if it's a, pol a political or official side event. Um, 
And I usually, I tell people two things. Uh, one is uh, DC is not the toxic place it looks like it is on TV. And when I say that, <laughs> And sometimes I, I say that because people will ask me like, how are you doing out there? <laughs> and they're genu like legitimately genuine, genuinely concerned because they think that I'm walking through the halls of Congress and it's like I'm pushing my way through all this toxicity and they wonder how I do it. And um, it's not to say that there are not certain topics or policy areas or or whatever, that, that there's not headbutting. But uh, on more often than not, I'm on, I'm on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. And this is one of the most bipartisan uh, committees um, there is, because I mean, who wants potholes? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> so, um, so I'm on this committee, and not that long ago, we put, uh, nine bills through uh, the, uh, not the most recent markup, but the one before that. And we were talking about estuaries, right? So water. And first of all, people will often say, Republicans don't care about water or the environment or something, whatever it is. And I often tell people, you know what? I wish that you could have seen this TNI markup because you wouldn't have been able to tell if you were listening to a Republican or a Democrat. These bills that went through, there was also a disaster recovery bill. These bills that went through the TNI committee unanimously, everybody was saying how important this policy was and how important this legislation was. And that was Republicans and Democrats all talking about the need to protect estuaries, the need to make sure that we're ready in case of disasters, not if, but when disasters happen. And that is not on all the different channels. I'm not gonna name all the channels. I'm not on the channels that people are watching at night in the rest of the country. So people have this image of what's going on out here and they don't get to see that in small business, we passed multiple bills unanimously because small business is the backbone of this country. You know, those are the kinds of things that I think, um, it's not just about us recognizing that with each other, it's about us making sure that people in our communities know that that's the case, because um, it can it can be kind of overwhelming and a little bit depressing if you think that your member of Congress is just like slogging through and it's all toxic, you know. Um, so the the first thing is it's not the toxic place. The second thing is the T and I thing. Um, if I could like um, uh, turn that on almost around, um, what are things you find? People also also talk about the disconnect a lot, and they say it a lot to reporters too. Um, people in my district aren't even asking these questions that you're always asking me. I mean, what do you find um, goes on back in your district that uh, is completely disconnected from how people perceive you in Washington or people perceive what goes on here? Um, that's kind of a, the, the primary topic when you go home. So the most popular thing, most popular piece of legislation that we have passed this year in the Illinois 14th, hands down, was the Stopping Bad Robocalls Act of 2019. <laughs> the most popular. And the reaction you have is the reaction I have at every single town hall. We've done 14 town halls this year. And yeah, oh yeah, I, we've all gotten three or four robocalls since we've been sitting here this evening. Um, but. I don't think that that got certainly any national news coverage. Uh, it didn't get any regional news. So for us, that's Chicago news coverage. But our local papers run everything, right? And so that's how people throughout my community found out about this bill. And then they would come up to me about it. So they're like, so how does this make the do not call list better? And is it actually going to work? Like they're like trying to preserve their emotions so they're not getting like emotionally invested in a solution if, if it's not going to happen, right? And so what was so amazing is yesterday we passed the Senate version of the bill. So this is the compromise version. It's on its way to President Trump. 
and to get signed into law, right? And so talk about like bipartisan action on something the American people want, they understand, and they are like clamoring for. And guess what? Congress delivered. And I think it's so exciting and it gets no play in the halls of Congress with these reporters. And so I'm like, somebody please ask me about robocalls because I will give you the juiciest, meatiest, most expansive quote. We can have a 20 minute conversation about it, but no one asks, right? But that is what people care about in my district. They care about health care. They care about like these really like tangible things that affect their lives, but the conversations that we have in the halls of Congress or the interview requests are driving kind of a very different narrative based on um, what is perceived to be the news of the day. That in my community, folks are a little bit fatigued with that particular news story, uh, and they want to hear about the legislative success, such as the bipartisan Traced Act that like something like 400 members voted for yesterday, and there's very few things that get that kind of near unanimous support. It's incredible. I tweeted about it. <laughs> yes. Tweeted so, about so next. Oh time, yes. Next time someone tries to ask me a question, you're on notice. Next time someone tries to ask me a question in the hall and I'm walking, I'm gonna be like, hold on, I'm, oh, I'm getting a robocall. <laughs> the Senate bill is making its way through and then I'll just, and then I'll just keep walking, I promise. Do you, do you feel disconnected in your district with what's, what people are talking about as well? Yeah, you know what? A bunch of people recently, um, I know I already mentioned my, my mom's a veteran. Uh, uh, I'm contractually obligated with my mom to mention her four more times tonight, so I gotta <laughs> get them in. No, I'm kidding. Um, so I, so I'm very like engaged with veteran issues uh, at home in the district, and um, also on the small business committee. So just recently, the Serve Act, uh, which got near unanimous, uh, it passed on the, it passed out of the small business committee unanimously, it, and it near, near, near wow. Almost everybody voted for it on the floor, <laughs> and um, and I I think the last time I was home, I don't know how many people asked me about that because our local our local news covers that kind of stuff. I also the Women's Business Center Improvement Act. Uh, I don't ha I got to work on my acronyms. Um, th that that went through, and people were coming up to me and they were like, "Hey, good job on that small business bill." You know, and and I think that I think that um, the disconnect is it, it's definitely there, um, and then I, probably because uh, maybe of who I am, people ask me about some of the you know we passed the Equality Act, so I, I've talked a lot about that um, in in the news um, and with the local press corps and national press corps, but. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of stuff that people are asking about. Surprise billing. I mean, <laughs> like that that gets asked about surprise billing, prescription drug costs, infrastructure, um, which is the sexy stuff, obviously. Um, you know that that stuff gets asked about way more than the news of the day. And you both agree with that too. That and I, I was the last Congress. The opioid crisis was front and center, and we passed a lot of great bills in a bipartisan way. And when you went home, I mean, those were the bills like the robocall bill will be when it works after it gets signed and when it finally works its way through. But all of the, you know, mil hundreds of millions of dollars that we pushed out to the states to help. And let me just tell you. Um, everybody knows somebody that's been impacted um, by a drug overdose or by a family member who's got a serious addiction to, you know, a prescription drug. And so I got more thanks for that on almost anything that I've done in the seven years that I've been in Congress because it just touched so many people and we all, it, it was not a district specific, a, you know, it, it touches every American in this country in some way or has the ability to, and it was really important. And, um, you know, these are the types of things that people want to know that we come together on. And the other thing we come together on, and I also want Americans to know, really, truly, on national security, on keeping our country safe, these are things that we really do 
uh, join in supporting our military and supporting veterans. We have a long way to go in, you know, um, over many administrations and trying to make sure that we, um, that we support the men and women in our military and then as veterans. But these are things we do together in a bipartisan way all the time. That's why we've got to get NDAA done um, and we've got to get some things done. Okay, well, I think we have to get our conversation done because the clock has run out. Um, I want to thank you all for coming, let you know that you, there are books out there um, if you have a ticket for tonight's event. I want to thank all these fabulous women for giving their time tonight. Um, if, you see, if you see Lauren Underwood anywhere in the hall, please ask her about robocalls. Thank you, everybody, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.